Stephen Michael, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Great to be here, Meb. Yeah, so first, tell everyone where do we find you today. Steve, uh, you first. I am normally in San Diego. Today, I happen to be in Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm coming from uh, bright and sunny Denver today. And I'm recording this also from Denver, waving at you from the train station in Union Station. We're going to talk about a lot of fun stuff today. But first, the main sort of umbrella is the private world, particularly private equity. First of all, I want to hear the origin story, how you guys met. Is there like a private equity for ten, a tender for private equity? What's the original meeting? Uh, how long you guys known each other and what was the connection? We had uh, had a, a fund that was up and running, Primark Capital. It's the Primark Private Equity Investments Fund. Private equity focused, obviously. And um, we always try to look at and solve challenges or hurdles that are in front of us. We built this fund for financial advisors for easy access to middle market private equity. One of the focuses of the fund is investments in direct uh, co-investments, uh, private equity co-investments. For those of you that know the market, that is a fairly difficult investment to come by. Uh, it is in a club environment, and it's pretty important to be part of the club to get access to that type of uh, investment. We had launched the Primark Fund, and we were in the market and found it very difficult to get access, to get the right access to uh, private direct co-investments for the fund. And that's where we sought out Makita. Uh, we were uh, have some, some commonalities in terms of uh, an introduction. Some folks in, in my background and, and Makita's background, uh, we'd work with some of the uh, same individuals, family offices, uh, institutional investors. They had made the introduction uh, initially. And when we met, uh, Steve, for the first time, we were in the need of uh, seeking co-investments. And it was fortuitous from our perspective that they have an incredible pipeline of deal flow of direct co-investments. And so we met about a year or so ago, maybe a little bit more than a year or so ago, and uh, started the the conversation about, you know, how can we get access to, to co-investments? And at the same time, the Makita Investment Group, they were, in fact, looking at bringing their expertise into the financial advisory marketplace. And so it was a bit of a, from my perspective, and I think Makita's perspective as well, a bit of a match made in heaven. They had exactly what we were looking for and what, what needs we had in, in the business. And we satisfied um, a need of theirs as well to get into the market. And so uh, as we've continued to step through this relationship and this partnership, we've continued to deepen it. And we found uh, more and more and more opportunities uh, to bring really the expertise of Makita, which uh, Steve will describe the background of Makita, uh, really bring that expertise down into the intermediated financial advisory uh, marketplace. Yeah. And, you know, Makita, for the readers of the Idea Farm, which is our research service that's been, we've been publishing for about a decade, are probably familiar with Makita because we circulate and curate some of y'all's research you put out every once in a while, which we think has been fantastic. But Steve, tell us a little bit about what you guys, what you do. Makita is an institutional consulting firm. We've been around since 1978. Though we've uh, we've grown a lot in size and prominence in the last twenty years uh, or so, today we work with about two hundred and fifty institutional uh, investors with one point seven trillion dollars of assets that we advise, and our services are quite broad. And as you've seen from our research, it's quite broad as well. We we help clients deal with complex challenges regarding asset allocation and risk management to selection of investment strategies and managers across every conceivable asset class uh, that's out there. But we've always had amongst 
our peers in the institutional investment industry a strong competitive advantage in the private markets. Uh, so Makita, for uh, well over 20 years, has been uh, very active in the the private equity, private credit, infrastructure, uh, real estate, and uh, natural resource, private natural resource categories. Uh, and ultimately, that's what connected us to Primark, uh, a lot of the great work that we had been doing in the private equity asset class uh, for institutional clients. And as Michael said, now having the opportunity to provide uh, that institutional quality access to the intermediated space. I feel like let's start a little broad, Michael, maybe you can kind of speak to this, but we're going to talk mainly about the the Venn diagram overlap where you guys are working together. But when you say particularly privates or private equity that you guys are focused mainly on, what does that mean to you? Because you have these conversations with different people. When you say private equity, some person's talking about LBOs and buyouts. Other person's talking about venture capital. They're different parts of the world. You're in Europe. It might mean something slightly different. What does it mean to you guys? What's the sort of range of opportunities that you guys and breadth of what uh, what you guys are looking for? We focus in on middle market private companies. And why do we focus there? Okay, so well, you know, why do we focus in private equity to begin with? Private equity has a return stream that has historically outstripped the public markets. And private equity overall provides uh, access to a, a larger investment universe that's out there. Almost 90% of the companies in the U.S. that have revenues in excess of $100 million are private. What that means is only a 10% sliver, or a little bit more than a 10% sliver, are publicly registered. If you look at the public markets over the last 20 years, you know, 20 years or so ago, we had about 8,000, a little less than 8,000 public companies. Today, we have less than 4,000 public companies. And at the same time that we've decreased by 50% from 8,000 to 4,000, the market cap of those companies that are public has gone from an average of about a billion dollars to almost $9 billion. So what's remaining in the public markets is, is trending on large cap arena. Right. So what's happened to all those small cap and mid cap companies? They haven't gone away. They've just been funded by private equity. And what you've traditionally seen in those smaller companies, those small and, and middle market companies, is a fairly significant growth. Those companies are being backed by private equity now. They're not available in the public markets. And all of that growth is now to the benefit of the big institutional investors that Steve's firm and Makita Services. So what we really wanted to do is, you know, I, I think it's a bit of an overused word, but we were democratizing private equity. Private right. equity has been previously reserved only for the clients that Makita Services, you know, the institutions, the endowments, the foundations, the pension plans, those big investors that are in the club that can write a very healthy check to invest in this market, these small mid-cap companies that have significant growth profiles. Uh, we're bringing that to the intermediated space, to retail investors, uh, high net worth investors through advisors. And, and Steve can give a little bit better profile on uh, the specific types of firms with the specific investment profiles that we target. But that's what we're trying to accomplish. That's what we're trying to do. And that's what, in terms of institutionalizing and democratizing this institutional asset class, there's no better partner to do that with than one of the uh, biggest institutional investors and allocators uh, in the market like Makita. And, and just to be clear on kind of when you say middle market, like what, what does that mean to you? It means different things, to different people. But like, what is that range? Is it, is it a revenue range? Is it a market cap range? What's the kind of sweet spot? The definition is a little fluid over time, uh, but I'd say generally in today's world, trying to focus on companies that have uh, enterprise values uh, less than a billion dollars 
certainly less than two or three billion dollars in size from general partners who raise funds in the neighborhood of you know no, no more than three or four billion dollars in size. So th- that's that's generally considered middle market today. And I, I would you know echo, of course, uh, Michael's commentary on the middle market. This is um, you know from our perspective, really the heart and soul of private equity where uh, businesses aren't in today's world large enough uh, to to be public and some that are choose not to go public because of the advantages of being private. Investment in middle market private equity provides investors with much more diversification into types of businesses and industries that that you may not be as exposed to in the public markets. Yeah, it's as Steve mentions that this is the heart and soul of private equity. But it's also the whole heart and soul of the U.S. economy. Okay, these middle market companies and uh, the breadth and depth that private capital, private equity has to invest in is almost ten times the size of the public markets. So we're tapping into that growth market in the uh, the U.S. economy and offering that uh, in a vehicle uh, made available to advisors. Yeah. So it's funny because, Michael, you and I were sitting in Park City talking about this, and we kind of went through a number of the features of private equity and and ideas and why to consider sort of privates. And this is coming from a public market guy, but we listed like five or six kind of points that I think is lost on most people. The first one that everyone seems to always get hung up on, and, and there, there's positives and negatives to this, is the liquidity. And we'll come back to that later. I mean, by definition, they're private, <laughs> so you can't trade them really on exchange. You mentioned breadth, which is one that I think most people don't really contemplate a lot. But just as a quant, having more choices, uh, particularly 10x more choices, is always better than less. And we talk about power laws on investing and how kind of some of the smaller market cap sort of op- enterprise value companies have the potential to scale and and offer these outsized returns versus maybe a trillion dollar company. We talked a little bit about taxes, but the one that I think you hit on that I would like to dig into more is this concept of access, right? So most people, whether it's because of accreditation or knowledge gap, whatever it may be, don't really have access to private equity at all. So if they do, it may be their roommate from college private equity fund or maybe it's a you know a partnership that gets pitched from their wirehouse whatever it may be but it's hard to get either access to the asset class or more specifically the individual deals which you guys seem to focus on to my knowledge there's no like co-investment website you can go to and sign up and say hey I'm a 100 million dollar family office like send me some deal flow <laughs> it's it's a lot harder than that. So maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, Makita, you guys have been doing this forever, how y'all sort of access this world, but also how you then go about sifting and screening it to get to a point where you're actually making uh, the end investments. I know that's a lot, but you can pick where to to, to start and we'll dig in. When we started to uh, look at this market, Mab. Uh, I ran a an RIA uh, in Sarasota, Florida, you know, five or six years ago, and we serviced, you know, two hundred advisors. And underneath that umbrella, we had bottom up demand from our clients that it was kind of the country club conversation. You know, hey, I, uh, my friends getting access to you know, private deals in, in real estate or private equity or, or uh, private credit, how can we get those? And it was a challenge for us to be able to offer that to, uh, as a platform provider, offer that to the advisors that were on our platform. This was again, five, six, seven years ago. There were a couple of platforms that were starting to come to life uh, in the industry. There, there were still some challenges with those platforms. These platforms, they reduced the investment minimum way down from you know millions of dollars to you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that. But you still had you know fairly significant concentration. If you had half a million dollars to invest in private equity, your private equity sleeve, you could maybe get two managers or maybe three, th- three kind of investments. 
in that. And so we looked at that as a bit of a hurdle. Uh, the other hurdle that was prevalent in the marketplace was just the time and effort that it would take to get into these private investments, right? Uh, most advisors just don't have the right access. They're not a member of the club. And it is a very clubby, and Steve will describe this in detail. It's a very clubby environment, right? And if you're not in, you're not in. And our advisors weren't in. As a platform provider for a $6 billion platform, we weren't in the club. So we, we couldn't get access to that. Even if we could get access to it, it was fairly difficult to understand which of the 3,000 funds that are out there that you really wanted to get access to, right? The ones that are knocking on your door are probably the ones that you don't <laughs> want to put your client's money into, right? Uh, so because the dispersion of returns in private equity is massive, from the top quartile to the bottom quartile, you're talking about 20% returns, annually of selecting the top quartile manager versus, you know, getting uh, a bottom quartile manager. So manager selection matters, right? And some of the other platforms, the, the one other thing that they did is they have subscription documents, which are very difficult, time consuming for advisors to, to really go through. So we wanted to put this in an easy to use platform, but the key to all of this, what makes it all work is sourcing the deal, okay? To your point, finding the, the access to the right manager and the right deal, and that is the partnership and the relationship that we have with Makita. They have access that's beyond reach of any retail investor, any intermediated uh, financial advisor um, that, that we know of, and th they provide a tremendous value. And, and maybe, Steve, it'd be fantastic if you could uh, pro uh, elaborate, provide some color on the access that Makita has to, to this special club. That's great. Th thanks, Michael. And it, it is interesting to hear you speak because it is it is rather clubby, but the the underpinnings of the of the club are really as simple as uh, experience, confidence, trust, and ability to execute. And you build up all of that over over decades of working in the private equity industry. So Makita as an advisor has been sourcing and identifying and providing our clients capital to general partners in the private equity space for close to 25 years now. And so we're a large allocator to the space and the high quality private equity general partner sponsors that we work with know us to be a, a trustworthy, high quality organization. And that that relationship and trust is kind of built up over, over decades of experience. The co-investment opportunities largely come to us because particularly in today's world of just a massive need for co-investment capital. Uh, general partners are generally quite interested in having co-investors in a lot of their deals. And they offer co-investments to their limited partners, uh, often on a no-fee, no-carry basis. There's obvious reasons why investors like the Primark Vehicle or other institutional investors have a strong interest in allocating capital to co-investments because you forego the fund level fees, the management fee and the carried interest. Uh, you don't pay on co-investments. And if you are investing through fund vehicles, those fees over time can add up to six, seven, eight, nine percent return reduction. So in order to produce a 15% net of fee return, a investor in a fund vehicle needs to have the manager produce a gross of fee return of 22, 23, 24%. Um, it's a really, uh, really high hurdle. So there's there's obvious reasons why limited partners like uh, Makita and Primark have an interest in uh, co-investment access. What may not be as obvious to your audience, Meb, is why general partners would freely give away this access to their groups that they have strong relationships with. Uh, and and the reason for that is they need capital to close deals. And 
this is particularly true in today's market where the availability of debt capital is starting to, to, to get reduced. But going back about 15 or 20 years, many private equity deals were executed by private equity managers cobbling together other private equity managers to come up with the equity to to finance a deal. So you'd have a lead sponsor and then often two or three uh, subordinate sponsors uh, providing the equity to a deal. And then you cobble together the, the debt side of the deal as well. The problem if you're a private equity sponsor in bringing other private equity managers into the deal is they often want board seats, they want control, they want to be active in the investment. And because they're going to be by your side during that investment, they also get to see everything you do as a lead partner. So going back 10 or 15 years, general partners started the practice more prominently of instead of cobbling together their competitors to do deals, they instead went to their largest limited partners and told them, if you want to provide us capital, we're happy to give you access to deals on a uh, no fee, no carry basis. And that was sort of the genesis of the co-investment uh, industry, which has evolved and deepened ever since. And, and those those motivations still exist in the marketplace today. So, so most private equity general partners, when they're looking at deals in the marketplace, they're looking at deals larger than what they would be able to finance on their own because they know they have in their back pocket co-investment capital from their limited partners that they can use to execute those deals. The more deals they execute, the quicker they go on to the next fundraise and and the next great thing that they're that they're working on. So the sourcing really comes from a need from the general partner community for for capital to execute deals. And the motivation for investors like us and our clients and Primark uh, is to is to get access to these high quality deals at no fee, no carry, uh, as opposed to getting access to them through fund vehicles. That's one of the highlights to the vehicle, the Primark vehicle, because 80% of the investments, our target allocation is 80% of the investments will be co-investments. So it's a co-investment focus. And all of those co-investments will come, as Steve said, with no fee, no carry which is a, a significant benefit over even a direct fund uh, vehicle. So we're in a position to be able to pass on that benefit directly to end investors uh, and advisors. There's not another co-investment focused vehicle out there in the market. And so it's a pretty unique opportunity with a partner in Makita that is that has a seat at the table. And, and one of the other interesting aspects of their deal sourcing is that many of the partnerships, many of the sponsors that are out there, a number of their funds are closed to new investors. Well, Makita has been in the space for decades, so they have a longstanding relationship and they're not closed out because you know they got into the club uh, before the doors closed. So that provides another level of access that would be very, very difficult for others to uh, to define. Help us to sort of visualize for people who just don't have access to this world. Steve, what does the deal flow look like? Are you getting like one email a day where it's like, hey, Steve, we got something for you. SaaS business, here's the metrics. Is it like people calling you on the phone? Like, like how does it kind of work? Or is it like 100 a day? Is it like one per week? Yeah, the, so the, the the way the process works is we reach out to all the general partners that we work with and uh, give them formal notice that if they have co-investment opportunities, we'd be happy to consider them. And so they ultimately put us on a list of groups that they can count on for co-investment capital when they're when they're executing deals. For the Primark vehicle, we're focusing on middle market private equity so there's there's also co-investments in you know larger buyouts and and growth equity uh, but for this vehicle we're focusing on as i highlighted before the heart and soul of the private equity asset class so in just that area 
we, you know, we're generally looking at about, you know, the the run rate right now is 10 to 15 co-investments a month, roughly. And, you know, from there, you know, we're, we're, we end up investing in, you know, one or two or three of that, of that 10 to 15 based on diligence that we do. The process, and, and I, I mentioned before kind of the importance of kind of confidence in this industry and ability to execute. Being able to execute co-investments is, is much more challenging than simply allocating capital to a fund vehicle for many reasons, but highest amongst them is that the time frame you have to evaluate and decide on a co-investment uh, is fairly limited. So, so typically when a general partner is working through a deal, you'll get contacted at the appropriate you know, stage in their due diligence. They'll provide you with, uh, under an NDA, all of the relevant material on that deal, their internal analysis and research, and also external research done by um, various you know, consulting firms and others. So that we can make a reasonable judgment on whether the asset, the company is a fit for uh, the Primark vehicle. But you may only have two to three weeks to do all that work. If you can't do the work within two or three weeks, then over time, the general partner will decide not to include you in future co-investment opportunities because they can't count on you to kind of get back to them in a in a reasonable framework. And so... The way our, our process works, we tend to give early indications to general partners whether there's going to be an interest or not. Uh, if there's a likely interest in it, we'll complete our due diligence as quickly as possible to confirm that interest with the general partners so they can move on with their process of cobbling together equity for their transaction. One of the key benefits uh, to this, Mab, on a, on a co-investment focus is this significant fee reduction that Steve mentioned. Uh, however, you have to be in a position to execute on that. Most advisors or even large advisory shops, you know, they may have a couple of folks that focus on alternative investments. A firm like Makita, they have 150 investment professionals over seven offices globally. When they need to execute in a very quick time frame, they're in a position to do that. Whereas most firms just don't have the bandwidth to be able to execute on that to take advantage of the benefits uh, that are offered. How many names do you guys end up in the in the Primark Fund owning? And what, is there like a target sort of wheelhouse as far as portfolio size? And then also, I'm just trying to think in my head also, and this may not be relevant because it may be from the Makita side and various things, but like, I wonder like what percentage of the names that you do the due diligence on are you actually investing in? Is it like half? Is it like 1%? I'm trying to get to a little bit of the portfolio construction and process too. Yeah. Yeah. Second, second question first so far and, and, and Makita began working with Primark in September of, of last year. So we're a little more than six months into this right now. I would say relative to the co-investment deals that we see, we've allocated to maybe 5% of them so far. And we'll we'll see how that evolves in the future. Your first question, Meb, was about uh, structuring. Yeah, well, I mean, just for Michael, like how many names are you guys kind of targeting in the portfolio? So the portfolio, because we're uh, we have this breadth of, of market, if you will, and depth of market. Uh, you know, ninety uh, percent of the, uh, the the businesses out there in the U.S. economy, you know, that have revenues in excess of a hundred million dollars. That's our focus. All right, so we don't really have a cap or a ceiling on where we can invest. When we first uh, started discussing this concept with the Makita team who has obviously been doing this for decades, we asked kind of their assessment of, you know, kind of where they saw the sizing of the overall portfolio and said this could easily grow to, you know, two, three, four billion dollars. After they put the word out to all of their investing partners, all the sponsors, and the deal flow that they received, I think probably exceeded initial expectations, Steve. And as a result, uh, I don't think we have seen 
anything that would that would um, provide any artificial ceiling on how many names we can get in the portfolio. The sourcing opportunities that we see right now with with kind of visibility into the the near term future are pretty strong. And, you know, for us, there's as advisors ourselves, you know, there, there's a lot of power in diversification. So we want to make sure that the portfolio is fully diversified. Generally, the co- any individual co-investment in general is coming into the portfolio at less than a 5% weight in the portfolio. And from our perspective, even as this grows over time, there's not a big risk of diluting the quality of deals um, that are done, provided that we continue to get the flow of co-investments through the high quality general partners that we work with. Uh, and I, I, I guess the best way to explain that to your audience is it's a big market. And to us, it appears like you can invest in the better half of the market with co-investments for a long, long time with a lot of capital. Um, so we see with the future of the Primark vehicle and scale, being able to diversify significantly with into privately held companies across industry sectors and that reflect, as Michael said, the the broader exposure of the of the US economy and to do so with only the highest quality, institutional quality uh, general partners. So a couple questions. The main like lever, I feel like when we're talking about private equity to make it uh, worth the while for investors instead of just plunking down some hard earned cash into SPY is the outperformance, you know, feature or goal. Like you mentioned that the spread is massive in, in this world. Talk to us a little bit about this special sauce, guys. How do you sort of ensure or you know, try to target in your process that these are the winners? Is it evaluation? Is it business model? What's the process that really winnows down the, um, you mentioned the, the, of the 100 deals, maybe the 5% that make it through the process? Yeah, I'd say that the vast majority of it comes even before the winnowing process in choosing the general partners that you're, that you're sourcing co-investments through. Makita's been allocating capital in the private equity industry for over 20 years. We have a a track record investing through fund vehicles that is very, very strong. It's sort of in the neighborhood of 7 to 10% per year higher than global equity markets, public equity markets. The co-investments that we're sourcing simply are sourced from the types of general partners that have created that track record over the last um, 20 some odd years with the advantage that they don't have the fee drag of the fund vehicles. So the confidence in the co-investments providing a level of outperformance over public stocks comes first and foremost with the selection of general partners, which is based on Makita's work over the last two and a half decades and identifying and backing a lot of these managers. The selection effect of kind of winnowing down the pipeline of co-investments that are offered to us, we'll see sort of 10 years ago whether or not there's additional positive outperformance um, from that. But we certainly would hope there is because we're taking a number of deals that we're seeing every single month and identifying those that from a variety of perspectives, including valuation and uh, relative attractiveness, identifying those that we think have a somewhat higher probability of success in the future. So I think there's a lot of strong tailwinds to the Primark vehicle vis-a-vis public stocks. And I, I would, I would, um, you know, speaking for, as, as a broader advisor myself that allocates capital to the private equity asset class would certainly agree that outperformance is the is a primary reason why institutional investors commit capital to the asset class it's become an integral piece of 
every large institution's asset allocation policy over the long term. But there are other great benefits as well. As mentioned, you do get diversification into companies and industries that are probably more reflective of the broader economy than the the public stock market is today. Everyone, I'm sure, is aware of the uh, valuation process uh, within the private markets, which really allow investors to avoid the hour by hour, minute to minute volatility that we see in the in the public markets. And so some of the stability of returns and private equity, one could argue is sort of accounting driven as opposed to economically driven. But at the end of the day, so what? They're returns that you're reporting to your clients and and clients care about whether uh, marks are are going up or going down. So uh, there, there's there's strong reason to allocate to the asset class in addition to the the strong returns it's had historically as well. If I could just add, you know, in the portfolio, uh, increased diversification is is a key theme. But when you break that down, uh, Meb, you have you have diversification by sponsor or manager because Magida has relationships with dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, sponsors and managers over the decades that they've been in the space. There's diversification from industry sector. We're not industry focused on one particular or two particular industries. So across the fabric of uh, the, the U.S. economy, we have geographic diversification. Most of our assets uh, will be in uh, North America. Uh, a few uh, may be uh, in, in Europe. And then uh, maybe imp- as important, uh, there it will be vintage year diversification. Investing uh, in the bottom of the market in you know 2008 and 2009 is very different than investing in, uh, in 2019 or 2020. And, and so it's important to get diversification across the board. And just accessing middle market companies, uh, middle market America, many of uh, the the advisors that we interface with, uh, the the companies that they see that may be in a portfolio, maybe we don't have the direct name, but it may be in in a sponsor that we own. They don't know if the companies are public or private. And so like Cole Haan Shoes, uh, for example, public or private, happens to be a private company, Toberlone Chocolate. Culligan Water, Breitling uh, Retail Watches. You know, those are all private companies. The only way you get access to those opportunities are through you know, big institutional investors, institutional allocators. And, and that's the diversification that will uh, provide uh, an enhancement in the return profile, risk return profile for uh, a portfolio. So say I'm an, an advisor, listen to this, I'm like, all right, you guys sound kind of smart. I'm interested for my clients. How does it work? Is this something I got to read like a 60 page due diligence doc? Is this tradable through the supermarkets? What's the process look like? So the industry uh, is in the process of evolving, right? And now these opportunities, these private market investment opportunities are being made available in this democratization push being made available uh, to advisors in formats that are easy to use, but you get pure access. This is not a hybrid or a synthetic. So uh, what you're seeing, for example, in the Primark vehicle, 80% of that are the co-investments that we spent a good bit of time talking about, direct access to those co-investments. That's what's in the portfolio, right? So this vehicle uh, that we've developed is called an interval fund. It looks like and, and feels like, for the most part, a mutual fund. However, so it's it's priced daily, for example. There are no investor restrictions on it. It's not like you have to be an accredited investor or a qualified investor. Uh, there are low investment minimums, $5,000 investment minimums. There's 1099 uh, tax treatment of that. So it's not like you have to deal with the, uh, the headache of a K-1. And uh, most importantly, there are no subscription documents to fill out. This is literally a point and click mutual fund ticker symbol, PMPEX, and it's available on the vast majority of the custodial platform, Schwab, TD, Fidelity, 
uh, Axos and, and a number of others. And so it's just as easy uh, for uh, an advisor sitting at their, their desktop to uh, select the fund, allocate to it, and make the trade. The day they make the trade, the next day, uh, it's priced, it clears, and they have private equity in their portfolio. It's just that easy. So once I'm in, there's always the big question. This has certainly come to light with our friends at Blackstone and their real estate misadventures. Let's say I want to get out. What's the process like? Obviously, this stuff um, isn't daily liquid on the actual underlying holdings. How does that work for me? So how it works is we offer quarterly liquidity. And the quarterly liquidity is 5% of the fund's AUM every quarter. And we make it easy for advisors. It's the last trading day of the quarter. They just put their order in. Some custodial firms will warehouse that order for a week or two. But you know, for, for the most part, you put it in on the last day of the, the, the trading period and you get access to liquidity. The fund has access to 5% of the fund's AUM and liquidity. Everybody uh, will get 100% of their preference, their liquidity preference, unless it's above that 5% uh, limit. And then everybody gets cut back the same pro rata. It's not like first in, first served you know, type of thing. So everybody gets treated the same in the fund. How we position this, Matt, kind of a couple of different comments I'd like to make. Number one, we only sell this product offering through advisors. That intermediated channel is incredibly important. We're not putting this up on a Robinhood platform where you have a ton of retail investors that may want to get in and out and day trade, want to get in and out you know, fairly often. This is a long dated asset. Okay. We, we buy long dated assets. So we position this to advisors that this is for kind of a long-term investment. This should not be for your daily liquid uh, investments that you want to get in and get out. You have bills to pay next quarter or the following quarter that you need that uh, liquidity. So it should be kind of at the bottom of your capital stack in terms of liquidity needs. And so selling it through an intermediated channel uh, helps to mitigate you know, the, the, the whipsaw that you traditionally see in, in a retail channel. And, but that's how we satisfy liquidity. And um, uh, that that's the process that advisors go through for that. Talk to me a little bit about private equity today. So we are recording this in Q2 2023. It's been a weird few years. We have had some macro shifts that we haven't seen really in many decades with interest rates and inflation. 2022 was a rough year for listed equities and bonds as well. What does the private equity world look like today for you guys? Is it a land of opportunity? Is it business as usual? Or are there some uh, giant potholes to avoid in the road? Give us, a, give us the overview. Looking under the hood, it's really a story of different markets. And as we look across the private market spectrum, there's some categories like the real estate category where the, the mispricing uh, is more obvious and the need to reconcile prices lower in order for transactions to happen is pretty clear. And so there's a general consensus that private, that private real estate valuations are going to decline this year. With private credit and private equity, it's not as obvious because even though interest rates have increased, what tends to drive the value of these assets is, in the case of private equity and, and the primary vehicle, EBITDA growth. And so far, knock on wood, uh, despite all the fears of a recession, a slowing economy, the data that the private equity industry keeps reporting on companies that they own is fairly robust. There's not a lot of evidence that revenues or EBITDA are declining. In fact, they continue to, to go at pace, despite the macro rhetoric of a, of a looming recession. So, you know, it ultimately gets down to, you know, soft landing versus hard landing debates about Fed policy and the macro economy. If there's a 
a soft landing in the economy and we don't have a recession uh, or a very mild recession, it's likely that private equity valuations will not drop significantly. If there's a big recession, you're likely to see a drop in both public and private um, market valuations as earnings go down. Um, so that's that's the big uh, uncertainty. And likewise, with, with credit, just to kind of complete the story, so far, not a lot of stress in the private credit markets fundamentally. I guess, bottom line, fun- fundamentals appear still reasonably strong uh, in the economy. The other big dynamic that's um, that's worth highlighting for your audience is transaction level uh, dynamics uh, related to to debt financing. And I sort of hinted at this before. After the GFC in 2007, 2008, there was again, uh, sort of a step function in the amount of debt that most private equity transactions involved uh, to reduce somewhat the amount of debt in private equity transactions relative to what it had been pre-GFC. Uh, and that was mostly driven by banks who were the major lenders to private equity, large private equity transactions anyway, uh, having somewhat more uh, stringent lending um, standards. We're now potentially in the midst of seeing sort of another step function uh, with that. Banks starting last year started to uh, rein in uh, the amount of capital that they were willing to lend to private equity transactions. And then, of course, with the Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic dynamic over the last six weeks or so has put even more pressure on uh, banks to sort of rein in um, lending. So in the absence of freely available debt capital for transactions, there's more of an incentive for general partners who are doing transactions to do it with less debt, more co-investment capital, more equity capital uh, in some uh, in some fashion, that's still kind of an early trend uh, that we're seeing, but one one worth keeping an eye on. Many many moons ago, we wrote a book on endowment investing, and you know one of the big differentiators um, and continues to be with a lot of these endowments and institutions is the private equity piece. I mean, if you pull up Yale's target allocation, I think public equity U.S. is like. 3% now or something. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny number. And they're obviously a very large part in, in private. How is the average um, advisor you talk to slotting this in? You know, is it a replacement for their equities? Do they throw it into like an alt bucket? Do they consider it some sort of like return stacking? Like how do most people fit this in the narrative of kind of um, their their models and how they talk to clients about it? So again, we had a, a big group uh, in our offices today having that exact discussion. Um, opening up, you know, for example, we're really trying to change the way advisors invest on behalf of their clients, right? Looking at the Yale endowment model, you know, some really smart folks uh, putting together asset allocation models that they believed in for 40 years and have really paid off. And so as a result, you know, kind of across the spectrum, you have single family offices or big endowment plans or foundations or public public pension uh, plans that have exposure to uh, private market investments, you know, from, you know, 20 to 35 percent or even more. Uh, so so as a result, advisors are, are trying to look at that in their investment model and how do they allocate uh, to, to private markets. On the private equity side, the theme that has emerged for us in terms of having uh, hundreds of conversations with advisors, advisors are traditionally looking at private equity as very similar to their public equity, just in a different structure. One's a private company, Brightling Watches, one's a public company, Apple, for example. Uh, they just come in different vehicles and there's a different access point to that. So most advisors for the Primark vehicle, for example, are looking at their small to mid cap allocation, their SMID allocation. It may be you know, anywhere from you know, 10 to 15 to 20 plus percent of their overall portfolio. 
they're looking at this and saying it probably is a good idea to diversify that SMID cap allocation, call it 20%, and split some of that between public and private. And so they're just taking an allocation, and we mostly, uh, in our fund, we mostly see allocations and an investment model uh, that advisors put together. And so we're seeing anywhere from five, six, seven, eight. We've had some advisors that, that have gone up to 15% of an allocation in private uh, market investments. So th that's what we've seen, and that's the discussion that advisors have had. They're looking at it uh, not as an alternative. Most advisors are not looking at it as an alternative sleeve and putting, quote unquote, in their alternative sleeve, you know, real estate, credit, uh, infrastructure, uh, private equity assets. Uh, they're actually matching up what we do with uh, the, the overall allocation that they have. That's one of the reasons that when we developed the fund, we really wanted to be a pure play in the space. So we weren't a, a, a one size fits all uh, bucket. As we look around the corner and in the future, let's say some of your investments work out and they start to moonshot. How do you guys deal with that from a portfolio management perspective? I mean, let's say you have the very wonderful problem of one or two of your names going up a lot. You know, a, a traditional public manager maybe could trim it a little bit. Is it something you just kind of let them float? Or do you say, hey, look, we get uncomfortable if one holding is 10, 20, 30, 50 percent of the portfolio and we maybe would seek, you know, secondary liquidity through, uh, you know, a transaction. How do you guys think about that? Good problem to have. Yeah, from your lips. The problem is sort of taken care of uh, for us in the co-investment world because these are companies that general partners are allocating to our capital is just side by side with theirs. And so the, the typical life cycle of a, of a private equity owned business when you own it is that you go in at a certain valuation as that company reaches benchmarks and hits KPIs, it might get valued up a little bit over time, but you predominantly get the bulk of your value closer to exit when the thesis of creating value in the company has played out uh, and materialized. And so when the value is created, it's generally around the point of a liquidation event from the general partner. And so if there is a company that is that is five or 10 X, it's likely to have achieved that strong performance because it was sold at that level and revalued at sale. Once it's sold, the cash comes back to uh, the fund as, as cash. And so it's liquidated for us. We don't have the ability uh, naturally to stay in it unless it's a, in the, a, an unusual situation where it's being sold to another uh, private equity fund. So uh, th there there are, the the vehicle does have a mechanism that that allows us to sell in the secondary market but it, it wouldn't be I, I wouldn't see that as a as a as a realistic portfolio management tool as we look around the corner to the future what else you guys got in your brain because we talk a lot about this and to me there when we were sitting down in park city i said you know there's just some areas where it's damn hard as a public markets investor to get access and so this is clearly one. Another, we talk a lot about farmland. That's really hard to allocate to for the public market investor. Same thing with startup investing, on and on. So as we look out for you guys, what other ideas are you kicking around? Is the main focus kind of growing this offering or you got some other stuff under your sleeve that uh, you guys are working on or thinking on? I think, you know, opening up the private markets, changing the way advisors can access the private markets is is a theme to what we're doing here i think when you look at coming attractions we tend to focus uh where we think the puck is going to be and, and not where it is today right now there there's a lot of uh product and a lot of availability to access private market vehicles in in credit for example or it's, it's continuing to build and continuing to proliferate. Uh, there's a, a growth that you see in real estate 
uh, access to private real estate. Uh, there's there's not a ton of activity or a ton of uh, competitors in the private equity space, but but they're coming. But how cool would it be to uh, access uh, infrastructure? Okay, really call it the elite of the the institutional investors that really have kind of anchored you know those types of investments. How neat would it be to be able to offer that investment profile? Uh, to retail advisors or farmland or hard assets. Um, one of the benefits of the relationship uh, with Makita is they do all that uh, and they have the access points into all that. So uh, our, our teams are in the process of kind of putting our heads together to look at the market landscape, get advisor feedback of what the demand profile is, and then trying to uh, put that together uh, w- with a product that, uh, a- again, provides this access, but puts it in an easy to use package. So, um, Steve, I'm not sure if you have any uh, uh, kind of thoughts on uh, coming attractions or interesting asset pools to that we could access. Yeah, I mean, I did for, for me personally, this RAA space is, is a brand new one. I've been in the institutional world for 29 years. So, uh, and, and as as Michael has sort of brought us around and introduced us to um, a, a number of RIAs, uh, I, I, I definitely see a lot of opportunity for us and Primark to to bring to this marketplace the best from the institutional world, uh, which is certainly a lot of uh, private markets, but asset allocation, risk management, kind of framework for investing that um, that may not be as uh, consistently applied uh, in uh, in in this marketplace. And that that's exciting to me. Yeah, I think it's it's certainly an open playing field. You've seen a few others try and I'm not going to mention them by name, but they came out swinging with uh, well over 4% fees targeting individuals. And I scratch my head and I say, man, that that's um that's going to be a tough hill <laughs> to uh to conquer for advisors as well. I like the hockey reference because I'm going to an Avalanche game tonight and by the time this gets published listeners there may be like 10 more failed banks and the Avalanche may already be in the finals we'll see. So we're just dating ourselves near a, near the end of April on this one. What has been each of y'all get an answer? You guys' is most memorable investment. It could be personally, it could be career related, it could be good, it could be bad, it could be in between, but something that's seared into your brain that you can never forget. I'll let you guys wave your hand. Whoever wants to go first, have at it. So I can go first on that. My most memorable investment has been uh, Primark, has been this company. This has been uh, something that I have dreamed about I have, you know, 40 years of experience behind me, 25 years kind of in the advisory, in the wealth management, asset management space. And um, I built a company to do something that I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, Steve had mentioned kind of some of the uh, key points of what we tried to do and what we're trying to service, but it's been uh, a big investment uh, for me personally. And that has been, uh, supplemented but by the relationship and the partnership that I've built with Steve and his firm to help us continue to grow and continue to take this concept forward. So it'll be something that that I never forget. And uh, absolutely, without question, top of the list, my most memorable investment. How similar is the vision from when you guys started? I know it wasn't that long ago to kind of where you are today. Because like a lot of companies, you know, you have kind of the vision when you get going and then the creative destruction of markets and competition happen. It's a little different. Is it pretty similar? Is it kind of the same inspiration? So you always have to respond to the market, right? You always have to react to, to your customer. And and I think you have to give your customers, your clients, your investors, what they need, not what you think they want really, but what they need. And, And so our vision and our focus has been, fairly streamlined, fairly straightforward. It hasn't taken a long and winding road, but it's been bolstered and supplemented from the the, um, the knowledge base and, and the expertise from the Makita team. 
Uh, and we started out without uh, kind of an institutionalized foundation, if you will. And once we did that, I think uh, uh, the the vision became much more clear. Uh, it was it was we know we knew the direction we wanted to go into, but now it's been very much focused with uh, the Makita partnership. Well, I was laughing as you're talking about that because we have a long list of current funds and strategies and more to come that probably fit under the category of things Mebs wants that no one else on the planet actually would want. So that resonated with me, including a few coming up that I think are the most challenged marketing ideas in investing history. So you'll you'll immediately know they are when we launch them. But I think that uh, it's it's always hard to know what that product market fit in y'all's case too product advisor fit may be until you start to have those conversations. So that meeting today is probably invaluable in, in meeting people face to face on how they're doing it. All right, over to you, Steve. Yeah, I've, I've got an interesting one uh, for your audience. And it goes back to when I first started at Makita, right out of college, our company you had to you had to work for six months to be eligible for the 401k plan. So for the first year, the only way I could I could you know save for retirement you know tax tax free was through an IRA. And so, 22 years old, right out of college, I did you know what any practical person would do. I looked at the sort of capital markets line and said, well, emerging market stocks have the you know highest expected return, highest risk. I'm 22 years old. I'll, I'll put $2,000, which is, was the limit I could put in, uh, into a diversified, actively managed emerging market mutual fund. I couldn't even tell you today who the manager was because in the past 29 years, the mutual fund has been bought and sold five or six different times. And, you know, between the the management fees that have been kind of gutted out of it and the annual account fees, the $2,000 that I started with in, uh, in 1994 has grown to about $2,300 29 years later. And... Every year, I, I I sort of laugh at it and I look at it. I'm going to hold it till till retirement and see where it ends up. But to me, it's sort of the ultimate lesson that you can't just be a passive allocator. Like it matters who your money is with. It matters uh, how your money is being managed. It matters the fees on it. This thing still charges ridiculous fees. I'm shocked anyone's in this mutual fund anymore, but they still exist. And you, you guys in your world must see this all the time, these sort of zombie funds that just keep going and going and going. So I'm going to see where my zombie ends up in in other in other 20 years. I mean, there's only one way this story resolves and that's Makita buying the fund complex that owns the fund and then installing new management, right? Like that's to me would be the perfect ending to this story. You know, I thought you were going to go somewhere slightly differently with this, which is you're going to go like the Peter Thiel route, which is like, hey, I threw some Facebook shares in this. And now my IRA is worth $5 billion, whatever, whatever Peter's IRA is now. That's the barbell uh, a part of the story to uh, uh, to Peter's. Um, gentlemen, this has been a blessing, a lot of fun. Tell us, start with uh, you, Steve, and then over to Michael, where do people find more information on y'all's insights, products, education, all that good stuff? Where do they go? So for Makita, everything you need to know about Makita is on our website. As I mentioned at, at the beginning, Meb, Makita's, uh, the vast majority of Makita's research and white papers is included on the thought leadership section of our of our website. I encourage anyone to 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 access that. We do, you know, I, I think put together some really thoughtful, well-researched papers for uh for our clients in, in the marketplace www.makita.com. And uh, the same for, for really uh, Primark, primarkcapital.com. Uh, it's a traditional mutual fund information that you see. Uh, we have fact sheets, um, our, our prospectus, our holdings um, uh, analysis, uh, with some white papers, educational papers uh, on our website. And for any uh, advisor, uh, it, we, they can just really look up the, the ticker symbol two uh, for whatever service that they may use, PMPEX. 
and um, we're available on uh, Schwab, TD, Fidelity, uh, uh, Axos, most of the Pershing, most of the uh, custodial platforms uh, carry uh, our, our product. And it only can be accessed through advisors. Uh, a, a retail client may see it on, on the Schwab platform. I know they can see it on the platform, but they can't purchase. It has to be uh, accessed through an advisor. Nice little tease there. Um, listeners, uh, we'll add all these resources to the show note links on the website, mebfaber.com, uh, and some more goodies. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Matt. Appreciate it.